Good evening, I'm Professor Pat Murphy and I'd like to welcome you to the final Burgess Lecture for the 2011 series. Tonight our speaker is Richard Panico. He is the founder, president, and CEO of Integrated Project Management Company. Uh, he started his career with Johnson & Johnson and uh, spent 15 years with that organization before founding his own company and something we talked about with our executive class today. Uh, he spent uh, his early years trying to build strong and cohesive teams and relationships based on honesty and trust. He founded Integrated Project Management in 1988 and the company has served over 250 clients and more than 3,500 projects over the years. And his company is well known for ethics and integrity. They've been uh, multiple recipients of the Better Business Bureau's Torch Award from uh, the Chicago area. They also have been recognized multiple times as a top small workplace by the Wall Street Journal, and Rich himself received the William Pollard Award for Business Ethics, and William Pollard is the former CEO of Service Master and uh, speaker in this uh, program a number of years ago. He's involved with DePaul University's Institute for Business and Professional Ethics and served for six years as the chairman of their board of uh, governors. He's also involved in what's called Heartland Angels, and Rich, we have something at Notre Dame called Irish Angels. I'm sure it's very similar, uh, stimulating entrepreneurship. He's authored uh, articles and papers. I don't know where he finds time to do that as the CEO of an organization. And uh, the way I found out about uh, Rich is two of his employees sitting in the front were students of mine and wrote about the ethical culture of the company and I'm pleased to have him here to tell us more about it. Uh, the title is right up there so I won't read it to you. So please join me in giving a very warm Notre Dame welcome to Rich Penico. Well, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Can everyone hear okay? Great, great. I want to thank all of you for uh, being here this evening. It uh, would have taken a lot more to get me when I was in college at 7 o'clock after a long day in class, and I'm sure you were all in class all day or working all day coming out to uh, this venue, but I'm certainly glad that, uh, that you are here. Uh, I promised myself this evening that this would not be a lecture. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, my intent here is to really share our story with you, because it's just not mine. You don't create a company alone. You have people that help you along the way. So it's, uh, it's really my story. I'm going to share a perspective with you, an opinion that hopefully, uh, hopefully helps you. Uh, I would also hope that most of you uh, are either in leadership roles, because we typically are in some way, shape, or form within, within companies or uh, in your own company, or even as a student. Hopefully, you've already started uh, identifying that leadership is important for you. So how many of you here uh, believe yourselves to be leaders or aspire to be leaders in some type of organization somewhere in the near future? Okay, great. Patrick, this is a good sign. We've got a lot of leaders here this evening. And uh, the story here is about you. Uh, what I am here to do is convince you that developing an ethical culture, sustaining it, nurturing it, is really about you. So while uh, the first half of the presentation really deals with, with my perspective on what it takes uh, to create an organization. The last half is about my own journey. So it is a very personal story about integrated project management. I'm not going to get into my days at Johnson & Johnson. While I certainly enjoyed those days, uh, I'll talk a little, about the, a little bit about my reasons for leaving and why I pursued uh, this venture. So as I said, this is really about you. Uh, we talked a little bit about integrated project management. Uh, this is who we are. Uh, we are in uh, four cities across the United States. We do projects all over the United States. And we truly are a, a consulting-centric project management firm. What does that mean? It means not only do we solve problems, but uh, we are involved very, very hands-on implementing those solutions and, and uh, uh, focus very, very uh, uh, hard toward sustainable results for our clients. And if you want any more information, the website address is here, so I didn't want to spend too much time talking about the company specifically. Uh, 
So, you know, what, what is a values-based culture? If we're going to be talking about this this evening, I think it's appropriate that we kind of align on what we believe a values-based culture is really all about. I mean, this is my definition. I don't know, Patrick, if it uh, meets, meets yours. But it really is establishing within a company fundamental beliefs based on, based on virtues, based on philosophies. Uh, hopefully those are ethical philosophies that serve as the underpinning for all of the decisions that are made, for the directions that are set within the company over years. So you hope that these things are going to be sustainable, and we'll talk about how you do that. But it's not only about putting those things in place, but then inculcating you know, an environment where others can adopt these, where it becomes a natural tendency within, uh, within the organization. As I mentioned uh, earlier, this is really about you, and I hope that as I go through this, uh, you certainly kind of adopt this idea, because culture, if you believe the culture resides outside of you, and you believe yourself to be a leader, there's a dichotomy there, because cultures aren't about just inanimate things, they're about people. So it's about in individuals who believe themselves to be leaders, to, to be able to take these environments and affect a certain dynamic in the environment. And that dynamic is around what we call a set of, set of values. Okay, it's not about a process, though I'm going to talk about the process that I employed in starting Integrated Project Management Company. By the way, just as an aside, uh, our CFO, Joe Jackson, is here. Joe? Okay. And Joe is, uh, has been with me right from the beginning. Uh, we actually met at Johnson & Johnson several years ago. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago because then uh, you'll start guessing her, her age and you probably guessed mine already. But we've been together a, a very, very long time. And not to divert too much, but this does tie into just some of uh, the concepts I'm going to present tonight. But the reason that Joe and I are together, and when I started the company, she was the first person who I called, is because, one, I thought she was an extraordinary leader. And that's been proven through the years. It was proven through the time we spent together. But she was also someone who shared my values and who stood by those values regardless of the political situation. In a large corporation, certainly that's not always an easy thing to do. So you have to decide truly what kind of culture you want to create, sustain. If you're going to be part of a culture and you consider yourself a leader, then I would expect that your focus is going to be on changing that culture to the extent that it, you can't so that it aligns with your own beliefs. If not, ultimately, there's going to be a crisis there. You're either not going to be happy with that, uh, with that environment and move on, or you start compromising. So cultures happen uh, by design or default. Uh, in our experience, I will tell you through the past uh, almost well, 24 years as part of Integrated Project Management Company, we have seen a lot of cultures. Pro Professor Murphy talked about the 250 clients. Each of them have unique cultures. I will tell you that my opinion is that most of those cultures uh, have been created by default, not by design, which is a dangerous situation. We'll, we'll talk about why that's such a dangerous situation, maybe less dangerous than, than ineffective. Okay. Also, you need to, as an individual, decide whether you're going to be passive or whether you're going to be active as you start experiencing cultures, unless, of course, you decide, like I did uh, 24 years ago, to create your own culture in a new organization because you've got an entrepreneurial drive. Okay. Also, cultures are either prevalent and pervasive or they're very fragmented. And again, I will tell you that there are very few that have very pervasive cultures. Typically, you read about those. Now, a pervasive culture doesn't necessarily mean that it is outstanding value-based culture or great culture. It just means that when you walk into that environment, as you start experiencing uh, different individuals interfacing, uh, the theme is consistent. You can recognize the values. Again, those could be very positive values. They, they may not be positive values. But in most cases, there are very, the, the environments that we see are very fragmented, uh, very diverse. And uh, what this means is that you may have uh, departments, divisions, departments, functional organizations that each have microcultures. Now, sometimes that's necessary if you go into a leadership role in one of those particular subsegments, if you will, or one of those divisions or one of those, those particular functional groups, and you want to create, let's say, a values-based culture because it wasn't there before, and you hope that that will permeate and extend beyond. But in most cases, what we find is that, that 
that the corporation at very, very high levels just allows us to exist. And what that does, it really disrupts the potential harmonization, the collaboration, and ultimately the efficiency and cost effectiveness of the organization. Okay. So if, if you are sitting here tonight believing that someday I'm going to run an organization, I'm going to have a prominent role in an organization, it could be of any size, you really uh, begin to, to ask yourself several questions. And the first is, how are you going to measure your self-worth? I mean, I've studied a lot of cases because of my interest in business ethics. And uh, most of these cases uh, are familiar to you. Uh, they've made the paper. Enron is one of those, one of the older ones, but probably one of the, 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 uh, the cases that's most uh, reviewed in business schools. And you, you have to ask yourself, you know, what happened in this particular environment? What did these, what did these, what, what did these individuals think when they were making these decisions? But you right now have to decide, you know, whether, whether uh, you measure your, your self-worth and the positive influence that you, you have, the sustaining, whether your goal is to have a sustaining legacy, uh, whether, whether it's position and power. And when we look at the Enron case, uh, it would be hard to say that truly what, what they were most interested in and how they valued themselves was in a positive influence, a legacy that they were going to leave. All right. I think it's pretty obvious that they were driven by, you know, the pay and possessions and the, and the power and felt that they were beyond, you know, the, the, the grasp of even the law, uh, their own policies, their own procedures. Okay. You have to ask yourself, what, what, defines, what defines me? Okay. I mean, it's, a lot of this is about looking in the mirror, and, and maybe some of it is foreign to you tonight. You haven't been in an environment where you've really had to think about these things. But truly, it's about understanding, looking deep inside your heart, your soul, and understanding who you are and projecting that, a willingness to project that in your role, in leading, in whatever capacity you're leading. You know, do you, are you defined by, by the position? Are you defined by your character and values? All right. I mean, we talk about a values-based culture. How can you possibly create a values-based culture if a significant component of what defines you and defines your character are your own, your own values? Okay. And what is your leadership threshold? Wait, for, me, for me, it was developing my own company. I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. I'll talk a little bit about that in a little while. But do you have a, ten, do you, do you have a propensity to write your own script? Uh, not everyone really is cut out to go off on their own. That's not a, a bad thing, it's not a good thing, it just is, it's a preference, right? Or do you wanna modify someone else's script? I can tell you that it's a lot more difficult to go into an organization with, a, with a, an objective to change the culture. Because in effect, what you are doing, the day you walk into that culture, uh, you are everyone else who preceded you. I remember going to the second company within Johnson & Johnson that I went to work for. It was the first couple of weeks there. And I remember meeting with, with people, particularly the wage folks, and, and they would start their complaints with they, they, they. And I would say, you mean me, me, me. Because they were holding, while, while they didn't want to tell me directly uh, that I was responsible, in fact, I was. So I wanted them to understand that I also saw myself as accountable. The point here is, if you're going to go in and change a culture, Everything that preceded you obviously has set, has set the, the groundwork. And it could be a tremendous struggle. When people have asked me, how long does it take to be able to change a culture, take a culture that's negative, a culture where the values aren't clearly defined, where there are a lot of differences in, in the values and philosophies. Uh, I typically stayed at least four years, and that's probably aggressive, unless it's a very, very small organization. Now realize I'm talking about a corporate environment. A lot of things have to be put in place for people to finally buy in and believe that this is the way it, it's going to be. And then there's the option of just going with the flow. You know, that's transactional leadership. Is that necessarily bad? It depends. It depends on what you have in your heart and what you're willing to compromise. For some individuals, it's, you know, the job and the in income becomes tremendously important. They've got families and they start making those excuses. You can actually move fairly high in, a, in, a, in an environment being very, very transactional, not committing your values to the organization, operating as a manager 
more as a manager and less as a leader. Okay? Because it would be very, very difficult for a leader who's truly driven by their beliefs to just go through a career and be transactional. Very difficult. Okay. We're going to shift gears, and now I'm just going to really focus uh, to my story. And the first part of this is, is just about creating the environment that we created at Integrated Project Management Company. I may even ask some of my colleagues to provide some comments. Uh, and it's unscripted. They, uh, they may not like the fact that I'm going to call on them. But this is a classroom environment. And I know professors do this all the time to make sure that everybody's awake. And I can tell these guys are very awake. So I may even call on somebody else that uh, is up there if I see that they're not awake. But for me, I, I, I think I have understood myself for a long, long time. And, you know, before I started the company, I was well aware of my drivers and who I was. And faith has always been important to me. You know, I, I grew up in the inner city of Chicago on the south side. For those of you familiar with the south side, what is referred to as Little Italy, that was the early part of, of my life. A uh, very, very tough neighborhood. Uh, I'm the only person in my crowd that, that went to college. Uh, these guys and ladies are still my friends. Uh, we, we share a lot of heart together. Uh, very, very good people. But I understood, you know, my values. My parents were Italian immigrants. And even when we got into trouble, we, we, we knew what we had done. We uh, certainly tried to make sure that everyone other than your parents knew. Uh, you'd much rather uh, probably take the electric chair than go home to your dad at that time. And if we had more time, I'd tell you about one time when I actually begged the police officers to put me in jail and not take me home, because I just did not want to face my father. He never, to, th to this day, well, my dad passed away three years ago, but he never heard my side of the story, because I don't think that he ever saw me as an adult, so he probably still would have tried to whip my butt. But uh, that's for another time if you invite me back. I also had a, always had this, this strong desire to, to positively influence people, uh, to bring people together, to accomplish more than what they felt they could accomplish on their own. Right, drive this. I'm, on, I'm okay. Okay. And you know this. This. Uh, I guess this is a gift that I felt I always had going way back to grammar school. If we were, you know, we were starting. I was always a person to start the club. And I think part of the reason I did that. I and mean, if you grew up in the inner city, you had clubs. You know, today they're gangs, but they had. We had clubs. And uh, the advantage of starting a club is that I could always be president. So maybe that stuck with me. And my sisters kid about it when they tell their stories about I always had these ideas pulling people together. But I got great satisfaction on being able to just ignite a group of people to accomplish something that maybe they, they didn't think they could accomplish individually or even with another group. And I, I always had a warrior spirit. And uh, that warrior spirit was uh, reflected a lot of different ways uh, through my career. And I love challenges. Uh, I owned two gyms in Chicago for about 20 years, uh, early, in my early 20s. Uh, opened up a gym on the south side of Chicago. I was active in competitively bo competitive bodybuilding. And uh, the challenge to me was to place really well and never do steroids. Uh, see some people looking, looking at each other here. Hopefully it's not because somebody's doing steroids. But uh, so that was a challenge. It was always great to be on stage and have guys ask me, well, what do you want? And I would tell them, pasta and meatballs, and they just look at me. But it, was, but it was the truth. So I always had that kind of warrior spirit. And probably most importantly, I uh, always felt that I was very independent. Uh, that independence certainly exhibited itself in the corporate world. I'll talk a little bit more about that. You know, and the key is, again, understanding yourself, knowing yourself, and how much are you going to accept and compromise in order to fulfill some professional goal, and deciding whether you have to compromise at all. So once I decided to, to leave Johnson & Johnson, I, I was telling uh, the professor and a small group of students over, uh, over dinner before we actually started this that, that I, I uh, provided a 14-month letter of resignation to J&J. &J. In other words, 14 months before I left the company is when I told them I was going to leave. Uh, there wasn't a single individual at that time, a colleague, who thought that was a good idea. They all thought I was crazy. And, you know, why was I doing this? They were just going to tell me to leave because I was providing this long advance notice. But I felt it was part of my trademark. It was part of being different. It was really standing out and having my values and virtues. 
you know, provide that final stamp on uh, my career at J&J. &J. And I will tell you at that time, the company could not have been better. The hardest part was that for that entire following year, they kept trying to talk me into staying, uh, going into different roles, but that was not ultimately what I wanted in my career. And I'll go a little bit into uh, why I made that decision as well. But I also, I also felt uh, that, that in starting IPM that we needed to have something scripted that talked about the company's conscience, how we were going to, how we were going to manage the company, the behavior. You know, certainly our mission, our mission statement has what we do as a business. But that is secondary. I always felt that that was secondary. And, and Joe Jackson, Joanne, who's here, our CFO, her and I worked on this together. I don't know if it was on her kitchen table or uh, certainly at that time in the early days, it wasn't the office that, that we have today. I'll show you that statement in a minute, but it hasn't changed very much over 24 years. We've kind of tweaked it to describe our business better, but none of the values have changed. But I wanted anyone who joined our team. At one time, I actually referred to our group as a gang. Joe probably remembers that. Every year, we've had a business theme. And growing up in the inner city, there is something special about gangs. I know this sounds crazy, but you think, why is there such a strong affinity? Somehow, these, I mean, they're for, for not the right reasons, but growing up in the city and the friendships we had, I always felt if you could create that kind of affinity through, through shared values in a corporate environment, that you could accomplish anything. So developing the mission statement was like the first attempt at let's get down on paper what we believe in, how we're going to conduct ourselves, how we're going to interface with each other, and what's really important to us. And then, of course, indicate you know, the purpose for the business. But right from the beginning, it was uh, the, the design was to create a, a particular environment. Um, if anybody could read this, uh, you're, you've got some phenomenal uh, eyesight. But this is our mission and beliefs. It's available on our, our website. I can tell you that in our interview process, you know, it's rare that anybody comes into, uh, into our environment that doesn't say that one of the things that most attracted me to the company was your mission and beliefs. And when they tell me that, I tell them, well, make sure that you interview us hard. Because if you leave here today with any question that this company does not operate to these principles, then you should reject our offer if we extend an offer to you. So uh, right from the beginning, we wanted it to be a, a document that was not a, a great piece of marketing hanging on a wall but truly a doctrine, a constitution for our company. So as, as, as part of kind of developing this business plan, if you will, because these are all components of a business plan, but they're the philosophical components of a business plan. You know, and, and hopefully as you go through your studies here and, you, and you, you learn about how to put together a business plan, you don't sell short that business plans require kind of this, this, this undercurrent of the philosophies and values that are going to drive these businesses. You know, as, as Professor Murphy pointed out, I'm part of a group called Heartland Angels, so I see a lot of business plans for startup companies. I have yet to see one that had identified its, its operating philosophy. It's all about the product, the market, and even some of that's not done really well, but that's besides the point. Uh, there's a lot more, and it tells us as investors, you know, how much passion is there behind this company, how is it going to operate, what are going to be the values that, that ultimately drive the most critical decisions. Okay? So we wanted to, to make sure that people who joined our company understood kind of the rules of the road, you know, what we expected from them. So we developed our values. Some of those are embedded in the mission statement that, that uh, I presented up here. But we have a separate document that's part of our performance summary and development plan. And years ago, we would meet, I think, every Friday for three to four hours to develop what is today our, our employee development program, something that we're very, very proud of. But a component of that is, is the vehicle that we use to provide feedback and a vehicle that we use in order to interview candidates. And we have, within the context of that document, we have what we call performance elements and character elements. Our values are captured, and I, I have about half of those here. But you can see honesty and integrity and courage and fairness. These are all things that are real measures within our company. And when we interview candidates, these are things that we look for. You know, we, anyone who joins our company goes, 
uh, at least through eight to 10 interviews, live interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews, okay? Uh, and half of the interviews are focused to the character elements. Certainly, I've, I've met with every person who, is, who has ever uh, been extended an offer other than one, and uh, I think I was, was ill, we wanted to make the offer, and I ended up doing a phone screen. And I was really disappointed that I'd broken the record after all those, all those years. But this is the most critical function in our company, is to get the right people on board. So when I'm sitting there interviewing, the first thing that, that I, I say to them is that, you know, it's pretty easy to figure out what you have here. You know, we can read your resume. We know what you've done in the past. We know whether you have or don't have the skill set. So that's gotten you halfway. All right. The other half is what you have here. I was mentioning at dinner, one of the questions that I ask candidates is, tell me what you want me to know about what's in your heart. And uh, everybody got a, lap, got a good kick out of this over dinner, but often people cry in my interviews. Now nobody's gonna want to interview with our company, but. And, and they don't cry in the interviews because you know I'm chastising them, but I'm often able to get to their hearts. So they tell me about their true character, what's really important to them in life. Someone at dinner asked me, well, Rich, what if you're interviewing? How do you find out what a company's culture is really about? And, and we said, one of the things you can do is not interview to the title, interview to the position. I mean, interview to the person. Ask questions of the person. Don't let the title of the individual stand in the way of you dealing with someone on a very, very personal level and asking them what's important to them. What do they truly, truly like about the environment? Look for consistency and what, what have you. So the, the character elements are really important. I want to point out that honesty and integrity, if, if I had brought copies of, of our performance summary and development plan, you'll see at the beginning it has honesty and integrity. Okay, if those boxes aren't checked, those individuals are gone. You know, uh, in the interview process, we tell candidates, if you lie once here, you get fired. And that's the stone cold truth. Uh, I can't fix that, we don't care to fix that. If somebody has that type of character, they can take that somewhere else. Now, that may seem harsh, but it's worked really, really well for us. And we also tell them that we expect them to, te to treat others with, with, with dignity. A few years back, we hired a very high caliber candidate who we let go in three weeks because she was talking down. She'd come out of a large corporate environment. We thought, wow, we made a great hire. I mean, she was just approaching people with a very indignant attitude. And, you know, she knew the rules, but uh, I guess she didn't believe us. So that's one of the ways to really maintain, we'll talk about how you maintain a culture, but these things are, are very important to us and, and things that uh, we protect dearly, okay? Again, this is all in setting up the company. Obviously, you could talk all philosophy you want. People want to ultimately understand, am I gonna have a career here? What is the business pur purpose here? And we tried capturing that in our vision, and I have an excerpt following here. But it's always been, a reputation-centered vision. Um, I would expect that in your classes, you've, uh, you've evaluated or you've seen a lot of different vision statements for companies. Ours has always been centered around how we want to be perceived in the world. I mean, we want to be perceived as the best, but we also want to be perceived as the best <coughs> environment for the top performers, uh, an environment that clearly is very, very consistent to its values and, and philosophies. And we want to create powerful context. And I think companies miss that very key word, context. You know, you can have a mission statement, you can have a vision, but if you don't create context, individuals don't really know what that means to them, how they fit into it. Context is, is you know, you're a piece of that puzzle. Context allows you to understand how that piece fits in critically so that, that, that there's meaning that is derived not only from, from the work in a specific function, but meaning that's derived you know, in the spirit of that company and what it's trying to achieve in a greater purpose in society and in the community. Okay. Now this is an excerpt from our vision. And as I said, very, very much it is a reputation-centric kind of vision. And it, it's, our, our vision is, is very simple. Uh, achievement of the vision is not so simple. We want to be recognized first nationally, then internationally at being the best at executing critical initiatives for the best companies in the world. But we want to be able to do it 
also having a very positive influence in our communities. We want to have a great uh, work environment for, for our people. So they truly desire to spend their entire careers with the company. It's another question that I ask in the interview process is, what will it take for you to retire here? And you know, in today's world, uh, often that's, uh, uh, you know, the response to that or the reaction to that is one of shock. Well, geez, I wasn't planning on retiring anywhere for a long time. But we can't achieve this vision without people who are going to be committed to the company for a long time. We've also taken the vision and broke it up into these key components, the global market, leadership, growth and innovation, prosperity, professional fulfillment, and philanthropy. And each of these has several measurable components so that every year when we do our annual plan, we can measure progress toward this, this vision. We've even taken it uh, uh, to an intermediate step and have a vision 2020 that's even more specific. But there are business objectives within it. There are philanthropic objectives within it. There, there are community objectives within that vision, right. all serving our mission and all serving uh, the greater vision for the company. <coughs> so now we've got, you know, we've got most of the philosophy in place. We had a business purpose in place a business plan that was in place. I will share with you that one of the objectives that this business has is to celebrate its 100th anniversary. And we're, we're very, very committed to that. I'm very committed to it. Now, you can see the company was started 24 years ago. I probably won't live to be 137. Uh, these younger guys here can, can, will probably, uh, hopefully get it to, to 50 or 60. But I'm really expecting that we're going to achieve this. Uh, it, it truly is an obsession with me, you know, and it's, it's, it's no different than you deciding here today, sometime in your past, that you were going to, to, to build this great reputation. That reputation was going to create great successes for you in whatever way you define success, right? I'm sure you didn't decide to go to Notre Dame assuming that uh, you might live only three or four years after you got this great education. So the goal here was to create something great that would be sustainable. Uh, I also believe that today that's harder than ever, which goes back to something that's part of my character. You know, in a lot of ways, you could say, well, that's almost impossible today with all of the buyouts and, you know, companies are, good companies are continually being pursued. How are you ever going to do that? And it comes down to your personal values. You know, I believe that, that leaders, true leaders can't be bought. If you believe that you are truly a values-based leader and you believe you can be bought, then you're just fooling yourself. Uh, I could have sold this company many, many times over. I, I tell prospective buyers it's not for sale. I don't talk to them because that, that's not the intention. I've had them tell me, Rich, everything's for sale. I've had some of them bring the street out in me. That's not a pretty thing, and I'm not happy when somebody brings the street out in me. But it happens. It happens, but you have to have such strong beliefs and understand what the greater, greater purpose is. Okay. So how do we, you know, and, and, and how do we establish this family? I talked about recruiting, hiring. We hire fewer than one out of 100. We interview the last two years is fewer than one out of 150. So, and a lot of it is, not, again, not because of the tactical skills or education. It's because we're trying to get to the heart of the individual, the character. You know, the onboarding and indoctrination is critical from day one. We want them to, to truly immerse themselves in the environment and test us. Are we who we said we, we, said we were? And we haven't uh, certainly have not been disappointed in that regard. And the last point here, 100% compliance and zero tolerance. This statement I made earlier, you lie once, you get fired. You know, I was speaking at the Paul one night in a similar forum like this, and there was an individual back in the room, so he stood up and he said, Rich, that's not very Christian of you. And I said, well, I said, I'm not condemning them to hell. I'm just firing them. And, and later, uh, later I learned that person uh, was a professor. And he came down and spoke with me. He said, if you ever go public, here's my card. Let me know. I'd like to buy stock in the company. So I guess he liked the answer in the end. Okay. So you know, how do you enable this, the, this culture? Because it's you know, now you've got the business philosophy. You've got the business strategy. You've brought people on board. And that's not enough. It's, you know, you've planted the seed. Again, during our discussion over dinner, we were talking about Notre Dame sees itself, I guess, when you graduate, that's like harvest time. All, right, all of you go out and, and, you know, you leave to change the world in whatever way you believe that you need to change the, change the world and, and create this great uh, opportunity for yourself. So 
we have to enable what we've created, and we've had to enable that every year with every person who comes on, on board. So how do we do that? First and foremost, with, with leadership consistency. We, we only promote from within. Uh, now, I've had people tell me, well, Rich, that slows down growth. We're all about continued, consistent, controlled growth. All right, why do we only promote from within? Because these people are proven. They, their values have been tested. You know, uh, military does a lot of the same thing. I know there's military personnel. These two guys out of the military. We do a lot of military recruiting because they get it. Most of them get it. They understand a values-based based culture. You know, they've been tested. The metal's been hardened. So very important to move the right people in the right positions. Uh, I've been told through the years, you know, when you get to 20 people, you won't be able to maintain the culture. When you get to 50, you won't be able to maintain the culture. When you get to 100, you won't be able to maintain the culture. I don't believe it. I don't believe it one bit. Do you have to keep working on it? Yes. But everyone who comes through the ranks becomes a disciple. So in a lot of ways, it should become easier as long as you're aligned and, and connected through those values. You know, winning and engaging the heart, you know, creating context for each individual. I talked about that. But winning hearts is harder than ever today because there's so many examples about companies that have let people down. So we have people who come in with other experiences, been with other companies, and we've already got two strikes. And that's okay. But, but for someone to come in, if, if they've given us three strikes, it's kind of hard to uh, hit the ball when you're ready, ready out. So we work very, very hard at, at gaining people's hearts. And, and how do you do that? You do that with consistency. You do it with treating them with dignity, by showing them you're interested in their careers, uh, describing to them how they can be instrumental in creating their own opportunities so we can grow, grow together. And by sharing. Uh, making sure that as a company uh, does well, they also share in that. Uh, zero degree of leadership separation. I'm always telling my staff, you know, we can't have a half a degree of separation between us. What does that mean from a practical standpoint? If you're setting direction and we disagree, when we get done, we're together. We're unified. We see in companies all the time where this divisiveness at the top is just catastrophic as it, catastrophic as it, 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 it moves through the organization. Years, years ago, Years ago, we were uh, doing a project for a client. The client was in Chapter 11, and uh, I happened to kick the, kick the project off. It was the CEO and executive team. I had spent six months with the CEO before we ever got the job, so I got to know them. I got to know the, all of his executives really well. In the kickoff meeting, I, I said to the executive group, I said, you don't have to worry about the competition anymore. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. Well, what do you mean? This is a company that had 80% market share. It's a company you would all recognize. And in a decade, went from 80% market share to 12. Realize you almost have to develop a plan to do that poorly in a marketplace. Hopefully, that's not one of the strategies you're learning here. That one's an easy one. But when, uh, when I said that to them, they were all amazed. And then I followed and I said, the reason I'm telling you this is that you are doing such a great job, and I'll tell you verbatimly, of kicking each other's asses that you don't have to worry about the competition. And then, and then I went around the room and I said, you guys don't like each other, you don't respect each other, you don't work together. And I said, there's no hope of moving forward unless this is fixed. Now you can imagine how popular I was at that moment. Not too popular. But again, it's about the truth. you know. And ultimately, people get it. They, and in that case there, the CEO did have to make some changes. He really had to align people to values, get, get people uh, you know, on the field that were going to play by the same rules, right? and understand that the greater good was more important in their individual agendas. And what you have to walk, walk the talk. I'll just spend a minute here. This has probably been one of the greatest positive uh, influences to our culture. Over the years, we've had a lot of opportunities to walk and talk. Uh, I'll share one example with you. We, we ask our clients to, to sign a personal recruiting restraint agreement, meaning that they're not going to go after our people. And clients always want to hire our people, which is a good sign. I'd be concerned if they didn't want to hire our people. But we want them to be concerned about our business as much as we are for theirs. So this, this client uh, made an offer to one of our employees, unfortunately. You know, she decided that she was going to accept this offer. Fast forward, I got involved with the CEO. Joe was very, very involved uh, with this at the time. And, you know, we talked about the situation. He said, well, Rich, what do you recommend? And I said, well, I recommend you rescind the offer. He said, well, I've got to talk to my attorney. He got back to me the next day, and he said, 
Well, my attorney said, you probably wouldn't hire her back. And I said, well, you're right about that, because obviously she didn't operate ethically either, because she has this understanding with us. So he said, well, then what do I do? And I said, well, I've already gave you my idea. You give me yours. So I expected his answer. And he said, well, I'd like to settle with you. And I said, OK. So we started negotiating a penalty. And I could see his whole demeanor changing once we started talking about money, because now it was just business. Okay? So we, we kept going back and forth. And I said, OK, we'll agree to that. And then I said to him, we don't want the money in the company. And there's silence. What do you mean you don't want the money in the company? I said, this is dirty money. I said, the way I was raised, I said, this is dirty money. I said, I didn't start the company to make money by resolving these disputes. He said, well, what am I supposed to do? I said, well, uh, I'm going to, to send you a letter. I said, I want you to write five checks to five charitable organizations to go to each of our four offices in the United States. And the guy was dumbfounded. Now, he, you know, we got the checks. I, I wrote the letters because I wanted to write the letters. At this point, obviously, I wasn't too trusting. Uh, wrote the letters, had them sign, bring the checks, send the checks to me, and then we sent them to these five charitable organizations. Now, when that was shared with our organization, this was money that we could have just distributed to our employees. I mean, it was just profit that we hadn't counted on. They stood up and applauded. And that's not the first time. We had uh, an example where we walked away from a million dollar deal that we had worked on for months. When I communicated it to the organization, they stood up and applauded. That's the kind of organization you want to create. Because that kind of organization can do the impossible, because they're driven by spirit as well as their talent. Okay. So how do you sustain? We're toward the end, and I, we'll have time for some questions. How do you sustain this kind of culture? You see the rose there. The, the rose has been part of our culture. You know, we, we've always been a passionate organization. Uh, and I could tell you, uh, when I started driving, all the way through my 20s, I got ma married much later in life, I always had a rose on my dashboard. <laughs> It was kind of my trademark, uh, my inner city trademark. Rich always had a rose on his dashboard. And with IPM, uh, we've always had a rose. I still have a rose on my desk. It's part of the passion. It's an example of the passion that we have in our company. You know, and, and in order to sustain this kind, of, uh, this kind of organization, as I said, the leadership group is critically important. Uh, recruiting and managerial succession, critically important. We, we do this twice a year. We look at everybody in the organization. You know, and, and uh, uh, who's ready to move forward? How are we going to create, you know, the, the kind of organization that can evolve so that we're not, so our growth isn't suspended because we haven't planned internal growth properly. But getting the right people in the right seats, responsibility and accountability, that's key. You know, do, uh, do what you say you're going to do. We hold people accountable. We hold ourselves accountable. Uh, we work with a lot of leaders that are great at dictating to the organization but you look at their behavior, their conduct, and believe me, that, that speaks a lot louder than any memo or any dictate. You know, when, when I walk into companies, we were talking about it at dinner, uh, Professor and Joe and I, and you know, we walk into companies going from the lobby with a C-level person to his or her office, we know all about them. I mean, if they pass individuals, we can read what kind of culture, what kind of leaders, leaders they are. You know, they even acknowledge. I've, I've walked with executives that have walked past their people and not even acknowledged them. So how are we going to be treated in an environment like that? Passion and courage. I want to talk about courage for just a minute because I think it's so important. Uh, I wrote a chapter for a, a book on, on ethics a couple of years ago, and it was based on a presentation that I did on valor-based leadership. And they had asked me to do this presentation and I said, you know, everything's been written about ethics, about leadership, you know. So I really started just thinking about what is missing. You know, you, I, I talked about Enron earlier. You know, what, why do people that are making all of this money have all of this power, still don't have enough? What is it? And I, I started just studying, you know, particularly male behavior at a very young age, you know, and, and how easy it is to be defined by your peer group, and how easy it is for your values to be defined by others so that you can be, just so you can be accepted and be part of that group. And, and at every stage of life, you know, what we're doing is we're going through different social communities, from the family to grammar school, there's a social community. If, if, you're, if you participated in sports, there's a, there's a social community there. And they, they create rules, you know, and, and you know, uh, what it means to be cool, right? And, 
if you can't step out of it, what does it take to step away from that and truly be a leadership, be a leader? It's all about courage. And, you know, a lot of you may be thinking, yeah, I want to do this. You know, I have these values. Are you going to have those values and are they going to be prominent when you're in a political environment and everybody is, is telling you and, you know, here you are making a nice paycheck, you've got a nice bonus, and all of a sudden you've got to put that on the line because, you, you know, your values conflict with, with you know, where this, uh, where this group wants to go. So, you know, intentions are, are, are truly meaningless and they're useful unless you have the courage to stand up. And just, you know, just be honest with yourself. But we're at a point in our history in our country where I think this is more important than ever. We need courageous people, values-based people to step up. You know, whether your aspirations are political, God knows we need help there. We need, we need help in the public sector. You look at what's happening in the corporations. It just it was either this morning or, or, or yesterday, I read in the Tribune, you know, that the, the top level at, at, at Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, that these executives, you know, are granting themselves huge bonuses, are still being supported by the government. People have lost their jobs because of poor decisions. You know, so what are those organizations like? I can't imagine walking into that organization and what that culture is like. But we need the best, the brightest, those with tremendous courage, with virtue, to be able to go into these companies and start at the bottom and, you know, just not be conflicted, you know, by what's happening around you. And you know what? When, when, when I had to make my decision to leave Johnson & Johnson, you know, everybody, my background was engineering, grew up in engineering. And of course, I had to do the analysis. I already knew what I wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to do the day I started with the company. It was the same thing I did when I left the company. But I still did the analysis. I wrote down two things. If I stay, I'm either going to get fired or I'm going to be the CEO of the corporation. Now, as likely, I probably, the higher likelihood was that I would get fired because I never wanted anybody to own me. Now, that, that was a good environment, but it still was not good enough for what I wanted. I wanted to create an exceptional environment. I didn't want the compromises around any of the values. Okay, and, this was, and this was for a very, very good company. Okay. One way of sustaining this, I'll move a little quickly here. These are just excerpts from monthly newsletters. Right? So when we talk about sustaining a culture, you've got to promote it. You've got to reinforce it with behavior. It's, it's got to be alive, upfront, prominent every day, 365 days or however many days you are at work. And for me, it is 365 days for everyone in our organization because when you start separating personal and professional, I think that's an issue. That's a cop-out. People tell us all the time, I know in our organization, I've been told, Rich, you're taking it personally. And, and you know, I'll be very disappointed if, if the day comes when I'm not taking it personally. Uh, but I've heard that um, often. But in our newsletter, I would bet at least 80% of the time the articles that I write for our newsletters I'd have something to do with our culture. As you can see here, you know, and the, the last one really is, is a follow-up to our annual plan theme, which is reach higher this year. It's imperative that we reach higher, which is easier to do if we continually support each other and take turns standing on one another's shoulders. Uh, and that's truly the spirit of the company. It doesn't matter what role, what responsibilities you ha have. If you can help someone else, you do it. And the other thing that helps is getting validation from the outside. Critically important to get validation. They have the outside world look inside the company and say, wow, this is for real. There are case studies written on our company. We have several awards for, for growth, for our culture, for values, for ethics. You know, and it's not, it's not Rich Panico. It, may have, it was Rich Panico and Joe Jackson 24 years ago. But it's Adam, it's Andy, it's everyone in our company. I don't think anybody's heard me refer to, oh, this is my company. I don't manage it that way because it's not intended ultimately to be that way. Okay. Focus on the vision. Make sure everything's aligned to it. Just uh, some final thoughts for you to consider. Uh, again, if, if you are aspiring to be a leader, to truly have an impact, uh, I could tell you that, that culture, it's a last statement here, I believe that it is the greatest competitive advantage that any organization can have today, and it will become even greater. You know. You can hire the best people, you can buy technology, you can buy intellectual property, you can't buy people's hearts, and it takes time to do that. That's why corporations struggle with it. But when you do that, you can create miracles. 
Look at the number of US companies that, that were great innovators can't innovate anymore. I can name several of them, but I won't. Right? So what's lacking? I mean, we've got more talent, and you look at individual talent. What is missing that doesn't enable us to innovate the way that we have? Not to say that there aren't innovative corporations. Okay? But behavior and example rule. So if you're in a position where you feel you could do it with memos, creating policies, you know, creating great mission statements. I always tell people, yeah, we've got a great mission statement. How do you know that some marketing firm didn't develop it for it? I know corporations that had consulting firms develop their mission statements. That's like asking somebody to put together your conscience for you. You'll be under the microscope. Years ago, we had Father Ray Baumhart, who was the president of Loyola University for 23 years. I think he wrote the first business book on, on ethics. He was a Harvard graduate. We had him speak to, to uh, all of our employees. And I remember one of the first things he said when we got to the podium. He said, you guys have put yourself in a very precarious position. And of course, you know, there was a little bit of a look of amazement on everybody's eyes. And he said, the reason is you have put yourself out there. You clearly claim who you are. It's everywhere. It's written. It's in your behavior. It's validated by the outside. Everyone is waiting for you to trip, to make that mistake. To have that infraction, you know, um, and I say bring it on. You know, it's, it's like having a great sports team. You know, you look forward to that next greater challenge, to have that team who's going to challenge you. And that's what you're going to face individually, whether you do it in a sole proprietorship or you do it, you're either challenged, you're going to be challenging your inner self, making the choice between it may be, may be money, it may be power, some of the things I talked about here. We already talked about courage. We talked about it being personal. If you get to the point where your decisions are, are just professional, it's business, it's not personal, uh, good luck at creating something great in your career. Not to say you're not going to make a lot of money, but you, you, you probably will. You've got a great educational background. No one owns a true leader. Spoke to this already. And it truly will be the greatest competitive advantage to create that culture where you bind hearts. Because people whose hearts are bound can accomplish phenomenal things with average talent. So just imagine what you can do when you take the kind of talent that's in this room and you bind people's hearts and spirits. And you do that. There's only one way that I know to do that for a long period of time, and that's with values. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I've got a question. So, um, what happens when you decide to, re to, re to retire or move on or whatever, and now a transition has to take place? <clears throat> I understand promoting with, from within is probably great, but do you do you foresee a change in um, culture? Maybe the complexion of the company. Okay. I don't know if you heard the question, but he asked, "What happens when I decide to retire?" First of all, I don't know when that will be. Uh, I love my life inside of work, outside of work. So, you know, there's, there's days that I certainly wish I had more hours to spend on what I enjoy doing on the outside. Uh, by the way, someone asked me when the last time I was here, and I said I was, I was driving my motorcycle through your campus. So that's one of the things I enjoy doing. Not riding my motorcycle through your campus, just, just riding. But that, that's a very good question. And the, uh, the answer is that for... I think 19 of all of our years, we've had a succession plan in place, which means that if something happens to me, that I t Joe becomes the CEO of the company. And I know how she leads. I know how my, my vice president of operations is responsible for running day to day. I know where his heart is. I know where the controller's heart is. And I know where their hearts are, you know, as consultants within our company. Uh, honestly, that if the good Lord took me off this earth today, the company would not miss a beat. And that's always been part of the plan. Uh, there's never been a goal to sell a company to the outside. It's always been about keeping it with the employees and the form and fashion and thoughts around that and strategies have evolved over the years. But it's something that we spend more and more time with. Uh, there's no other way to accomplish the 100-year goal. And, and I am serious about that. But we have insurances in place, all the practical components to do that. And we've had that in place for a long time. Other questions?
Yes. Okay. Well, well, that's a good question. The under the microscope is that our company is under a microscope, okay, by everyone in the outside world. Because, you know, if you put yourself out there as being the best uh, from an ethical standpoint, you know, having zero tolerance, everyone's waiting for you to trip because they don't believe it anymore. I mean, if we went back 50 years ago, it probably wouldn't be such a phenomenal statement because at least it appears, if you look at the great companies, those that have been around 100 years, at least at, at some point in their history and for many years, for decades, they operated this way. Right? That was the convention. The difference today is that we're an anomaly. We shouldn't be an anomaly. It's the way business should be conducted. The zero tolerance is around our values and conformance to the values within our environment. You're either stone serious about what's important in your environment or you're not. You know, so if if I lay out the rules, here we are in an interview, you're on board, and say, here's the rules. Do you agree with them? Oh, yeah, I agree with them. Okay, so somehow, you know, after you start, you decide to violate the rules. That's our fault. I'm sorry, we're dealing with intelligent adults here. And that's okay. It just means you can't work here. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. You know, we don't care to fix, you know, someone's integrity, you know. Uh, I don't know that I have enough time to do that, that anybody in our organization has enough time to do that. We want those kind of people to, to join us because that is what has been consistent in their lives. That's what's important in their lives. You know, and, and more and more people find us. I mean, I can't tell you how many interviews we have today where people said, we've heard about you, I've read about you, a friend has told me about you, you know, I've been in other environments, I hope this is for real. Yes. Okay. He had asked me if I can recall some time in my own career where I, I, I did, was not able to live up to my own ethical standards and what I did. Okay. Uh, first of all, the answer is no, because I, I never, you know, I, I didn't care if I got fired. I mean, you know, first of all, I was the first person in my family that went through college. I mean, m my dad was, was extraordinarily intelligent, didn't have the opportunities that I had, you know, and I never saw my father compromise his integrity, his honesty. And I thought, my dad could do this with an eighth grade education, always be true to himself, and he had a family to raise in some pretty difficult times. How could I accept compromise to my own values and philosophies when I've got options? You know, I, certainly with my background, I could go anywhere I wanted to go. When I was with Johnson & Johnson, I think I already mentioned, you know, I felt that if I stayed, I'd either go to the top or get fired. You know, and they were both, I thought, equally plausible. Because with my spirit and the fact that I wouldn't compromise, I felt that at some point in time that might be an issue. And that's okay. But each of you is going to have to make that decision at some point in time. And, and if you don't, uh, you know, God bless you. I hope you're happy in your career and happy with yourself as a person because you're going to be sitting there with a bag of money at the end of your life whenever that is, and I hope that brings you a lot of satisfaction. Okay. Well, thank you, and I'm sure we're still sticking around.